The Earth and the Sun have reached the point of March equinox. What does this mean? It means that the path of the Sun's arc across the sky has aligned with the celestial equator. The celestial equator is a great circle which we can imagine crossing our sky like an enormous hoop with the hoop's exact center located down in the center of the Earth. The hoop or ring of the celestial equator will be found 90 degrees of arc down from the point of the North Celestial Pole, which is directly above the North Pole on our Earth and around which the entire night sky appears to turn from the perspective of an observer on Earth located anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere all the way down to the equator, and which is shown in this planetarium from Stellarium in the upper left of your screen where the lines all come together in the sky. I've indicated the point of the North Celestial Pole with the label 90 degrees because it is 90 degrees of arc up or north from the celestial equator. We can count down by arc degrees from that north celestial pole to find the 80 degree ring, then the 70 degree ring, then the 60 degree ring, all the way down to the celestial equator, which is designated as zero degrees. And we can also continue to count degrees of arc south of the celestial equator, starting with minus 10 degrees, then minus 20 degrees, all the way down to minus 90 degrees, which would take us down to the point of the south celestial pole, but we can't see the south celestial pole from the northern hemisphere. We can only see that when we're in the southern hemisphere. So the March equinox occurs when the sun's path lines up with the celestial equator, 90 degrees down, from the North Celestial Pole and 90 degrees up from the South Celestial Pole. The Sun stays on that line all day as we rotate on our axis. The motion I'm showing here of the Sun moving, I'm moving the planetarium ahead rapidly 24 hours at a time in order to show the Sun at about the same time each successive morning as we look towards the east. You can see the Sun just after it rises as we continue through the year. The sun's arc continues moving further north until it reaches its most northerly arc of the year on the June solstice, which you can see here on or around the 21st of June each year. How far north of the celestial equator does the sun's daily arc get on the June solstice? Well, here again is the ring of the celestial equator, and we can count the rings indicating degrees of arc and see that the sun's northernmost arc is actually north of the plus 20 degree circle, and it's almost to the plus 25 degree circle. In fact, at its northernmost day of June solstice each year, the sun's arc gets all the way to plus 23.4 degrees north of the celestial equator. The reason that's as far as it goes is that our Earth's axis of rotation is tilted by that much from the plane of our relationship with the Sun. So when our North Pole is pointed most towards the Sun, the Sun will be 23.4 degrees north of the celestial equator, which happens at the June solstice each year. As we continue through the year, the sun's path will begin to move back south, away from its northernmost point at the June solstice, and it will again cross the celestial equator at the next equinox, which takes place in September, around September 21 or September 22, but this time it's crossing the celestial equator on the way back down, or south, away from the North Pole. So now its arc will again be on the celestial equator, on that equinox day, but moving south this time instead of moving north the way it was when it crossed the celestial equator back at the March equinox. After crossing the celestial equator at the September equinox, the sun's path continues to move down, or south, towards its most southerly arc. So its path on its daily arc will now be south of the celestial equator until it reaches its most southerly path across the sky, which it reaches at the December solstice, around December 21st. For those in the northern hemisphere, this arc will be the lowest arc the sun takes across the sky all year, well south of the ring of the celestial equator. How far south of the celestial equator will it be? Well, of course, 
it will cross the sky along the arc of a circle that will be 23.4 degrees south of the ring of the celestial equator. You can easily see in this planetarium that the arc of the sun's circle that is above the horizon is going to be much smaller at the December solstice for observers in the northern hemisphere. The sun will be spending much more of its circle, its circular path below the horizon, and only a small part of that circle will be above the horizon. Whereas in the summer, much more of the circle is above the horizon than below it. After the point of December solstice, the sun's arc turns back towards the north and begins moving back up towards the celestial equator again. And when do you think that its arcing path will reach that celestial equator? Right, at the March equinox, when it crosses the celestial equator again on the way back north. So, for the northern hemisphere, the March equinox is the crossing back up towards the summer solstice and is called the spring equinox or the vernal equinox. The September equinox is the crossing back down towards the winter solstice and it's called the fall equinox or the autumnal equinox. When the sun's arc is north of the celestial equator, then more of the sun's circle is above the horizon during each 24 hour rotation of our earth for those of us in the northern hemisphere and thus hours of daylight are longer than hours of darkness but when the sun is below or south of the celestial equator then hours of daylight are shorter than hours of darkness for each 24 hour period for those of us in the northern hemisphere and the situation is reversed in the southern hemisphere when the sun is crossing the celestial equator it rises due east and sets due west and hours of daylight and darkness are roughly equal. But the real definition of equinox has to do with crossing the celestial equator, not exact equality of daylight and darkness. Now, while it's helpful to see what's actually going on using a planetarium, very helpful, and using computer animation, in previous centuries, this annual motion was often depicted using a simpler diagram, depicting the yearly journey just as a circle on a piece of paper as we see in this zodiac wheel from the year 1618. Imagine in this diagram that we're traveling around the outer edge of this circle as we go throughout the year. And this one's arranged so that our motion is clockwise on the page. But that's just, you could do it the other way too. I've drawn an orange line to show where the sun crosses the celestial equator. It's gonna cross it twice each year at those two red X's where the, our path on the outer edge crosses that orange line, once on the way up and once on the way back down. The half of the circle that's above this line indicates the half of the year when the sun's arc is traveling north of the celestial equator and the days are longer than nights. And the lower half of the circle indicates the half of the year when the sun's arc is south of the celestial equator and days are shorter than nights. The March equinox where we started the video is on the left side of this particular arrangement on the page and so as we travel around the edge clockwise we go up from there to get to the June solstice the longest day of the year and from there the days begin to grow shorter again as the Sun's arc begins to move back south towards the celestial equator again which will cross at the September equinox on the right which is also marked with an X for crossing point and on down to the shortest day of the year at the December solstice. From there, the sun's path turns again and begins to move back towards the north and it'll cross the celestial equator at the X on the left, which is the March equinox again, where we are now as I make this video. As you can see, this diagram from 1618 includes drawings of the zodiac signs, which come from the constellations that occupy the belt through which the sun and the planets appear to move from our perspective on Earth. And, and they give us additional markers beyond those four of the solstices and equinoxes to help further subdivide the circle and see where we are. So if you watched very closely in the planetarium part of this video, you would see that the sun's path 
was crossing the celestial equator on the way north at the March equinox in between the constellations Pisces and Aquarius. The sun was in the, the space between Pisces and Aquarius when it crossed the celestial equator. Now, a phenomenon called precession causes this crossing point to move very slowly over the millennia, as if the background of stars is delayed over the millennia. I'm not going to go into that uh, mechanism more than to just explain that it delays the background of stars on that specific day, for instance, the day of spring equinox, so that if we were to dial back by more than 2,000 years, the background of stars at the March equinox would have been the constellation Aries, the ram. And so that period of time was known as the Age of Aries. And that began a little bit prior to 2000 BC, which means about 4,200 years ago from where we are today. If we go back to an age even earlier than that, then the background of stars in which the sun would have been positioned on the March equinox would have been the constellation Taurus, which is why that processional age is referred to as the Age of Taurus, a time of even more distant antiquity, prior the, in the millennia prior to 2100 BC, stretching all the way back to earlier than 4200 BC, a little bit earlier than 4200 BC. If the March equinox took place in Taurus, as you can see from this diagram, then the summer solstice in that age would have been in Leo, the lion, and the fall equinox would have been in Scorpio, and the winter solstice would have been in Aquarius. This pattern that we've just observed actually forms the framework for the sophisticated and profound system of celestial metaphor underlying the world's ancient myths, myths from virtually every culture on our planet, from every inhabited continent and island. We see it, for example, in the vision of Ezekiel described in the book of Ezekiel, in which the prophet describes rings and a set of creatures with the likeness of an ox, of a lion, of an eagle, and of a man. These likenesses that are described correspond to the constellations from that extremely ancient age of Taurus in which the sun crossed the March equinox in the constellation of the bull of Taurus and reached the point of summer solstice in the constellation of the lion of Leo and crossed the September equinox in the constellation of Scorpio, which is close to another constellation that's called the Eagle, as we'll see in a moment. I'll show you. And reached the point of winter solstice in the constellation of Aquarius, which is described in the vision as the likeness of a man. This same series of likenesses is also traditionally associated with the four Gospels of the New Testament, which ancient sources such as Augustine or Augustine and Ambrose and Irenaeus disagreeing with one another as to which gospel goes with which figure, but they're all using the same four signs or constellations from the age of Taurus, the same four zodiac likenesses from the age of Taurus, the bull or the ox, the lion, the eagle, and the man. To illustrate Quickly, the proximity of the scorpion and the eagle in the heavens. Here's a star chart showing the constellation Scorpio. If we travel up or north from Scorpio directly along the Milky Way, we come to the constellation known as Aquila, the eagle. And so that's why we can translate that eagle in the text of Ezekiel to the fall equinox that took place in the constellation of Scorpio during the age of Taurus. The ancient myths from around the world use this framework of the heavenly cycles to convey profound truths which are very necessary to us even in this present day, very beneficial to our lives. I hope this discussion helps you to envision what's taking place at the March equinox and 
at the other important stations of the year, the equinoxes and the solstices. And I hope it will spur your interest to go to the ancient myths, this precious inheritance in the ancient myths given to our distant ancestors like an infinite treasure to learn more about what they hold for you and how they can be a blessing to your life.